أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سيقولون ثلاثة رابعهم كلبهم ويقولون خمسة سادسهم كلبهم رجما بالغيب ويقولون سبعة وثامنهم كلبهم قل ربي أعلم بعدتهم ما يعلمهم إلا قليل فلا تمار فيهم إلا مراء ظاهرا ولا تستفت فيهم منهم أحدا ولا تقولن لشيء إني فاعل ذلك غدا إلا أن يشاء الله واذكر ربك إذا نسيت وقل عسى أن يهدي لربي لأقرب من هذا رشدا ولبثوا في كهفهم ثلاثمائة سنين وازدادوا تسعا قل الله أعلم بما لبثوا له غيب السماوات والأرض أبصر به وأسمع ما لهم من دونه من ولي ولا يشرك في حكمه أحدا صدق الله العظيم This is the continuation of the same story of the people of Cave. As we talked in detail about the story of those people, of those youth who left their town for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and went into a cave. And the purpose for leaving the town going to the cave was to protect their iman and to safeguard their deen. They left everything behind them. They were the children of the leaders of that community who were living in all kind of luxurious life. But they sacrificed all of that for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the purpose of ibrah so that we learn lessons from it is narrating their story in these ayahs of Al-Quran Al-Kareem and we talked about most of it in the previous sessions there are few ayahs that are left although we talked about the message of the ayah but now inshallah we'll be talking about the wordings of the ayah these ayahs سَيَقُولُونَ ثَلَاثَةُ الرَّابِعُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the number of those people, how many people were there in that cave. How many youth were together when they left that town and they went into the cave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first thing, let's see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts it before trying to find out what was the exact number of those people. He says, سَيَقُولُونَ ثَلَاثَةُ الرَّابِعُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ Soon they will say, there were three of them, the fourth was the dog. وَيَقُولُونَ خَمْسَةٌ سَادِسُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ رَجْمًا بِالْغَيْبِ And they will say there were five, and the sixth were their dog, guessing at unseen. No one has seen, they are trying to guess. رَجْمًا بِالْغَيْبِ Guessing at unseen, or we may call it, that shooting at unseen. That you don't know what you are shooting at, but you just try to shoot at something. And you don't know what is going to hit. وَيَقُولُونَ سَبْعَةٌ وَثَامِنُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ And they will say that there were seven and the eighth was their dog. قُلْ رَبِّي Allah says, My Lord knows the best of their number. مَا يَعْلَمُهُمْ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ Very few people know their number. Now, at looking, after looking at this, what do you think was their number? I'm not asking a question for you to know what is the number, but at, by looking at the ayahs, what do you think that we can figure out from this? Subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts it in such a way that after reading this, still you have to wonder what could be their number. And what's the reason? The reason is very simple. And that is, 
the purpose of their story is not to know how many people were there. The main thing is to know why were they there. What put them there? What was their purpose of being over there? Why did they leave that town? And just to discuss their number and the exact location of that cave and then try to write the whole history about it and investigations and research, that will give us nothing. Say there were six of them. Or say there were seven. So after just discussing the whole day of their number and then finding out that some people said it was seven, there were six, some others say there were seven, some others say there were eight, what is it that we will get out of it? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to keep the main story as the main part of it and does not want us to just be lost in other things. If we are sidetracked tracked by these things and we just keep on getting off the main theme and the main purpose of it, then of course we have lost the purpose of mentioning their story in Quran al-Kareem. Whereas Quran is not a book of history. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just telling us a history so that we can do more research on history. The purpose is to learn our lessons and to know our deen and iman and see how Allah helps. And this is the main thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us and this is why he puts it in this way. Once we know this, coming back to the same topic of their number. How many people were there? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned three different opinions. Sayaquluna thalatha, number one, three, the second opinion, four, and the uh, third opinion is Sab'atun wa thaminuhum kalbuhum. Seven and the eighth was their God. So seven people. After the first two opinions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, he mentioned three opinions, three, five, and seven. After the first two opinions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Rajmam bil ghayyid. People will say these numbers, shooting at unseen. So those who say three, and the fourth was the dog, those who say five, and the sixth was the dog, Allah says about it, Rajmam bil ghayyid, shooting at unseen. And then he mentions that, some people will say there were seven and eight was their dog. After that also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Rabbi a'lamu bi'iddatihim. Say, my Lord knows their exact number. Accordingly, some of the Mufassirin and many of the Sahaba Rizwanullah say that we don't know their number. Sayyidina Abdullah bin Abbas radiyallahu anhu once he recited this ayah and he said وَأَنَا مِنَ الْقَلِيلِ I'm of those few people who know that exact number. So they asked him how many were there. He said seven. Because this is how the ayahs are indicating to it. Some of us also mention another way of how these ayahs indicate to us that there were seven people. And that is, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrates the story, we read at the early ayahs, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when they woke up after sleeping for 309 years, and those ayahs are coming of their exact number of the years, when they woke up, they started discussing among themselves. قَالَ قَائِلٌ مِّنْهُمْ كَمْ لَبِثْتُمْ One of them asked, for how long did you stay? How long were you sleeping for? So this is one person now. Qalu. They said. We stayed for. Yawman aw ba'da yawm. A day or less than a day. So according to the Arabic language. When plural is used. How many people should be there? At least three. So one person asked. Three people at least are replying. That stayed for a day. Or less than a day. So now these are all together, four people. There were some other people who said, قَالُوا رَبُّكُمْ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا لَبِثْتُمْ They said, your Lord knows the best, how long did you stay there? Or for how long were you sleeping? So now other three people. 
So one plus three plus three, that's seven people. But these are only indications. The way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts it in ayahs, we cannot determine anything by these ayahs. They are only indications. And wallahu a'lamu bi haqiqat al-hal, Allah knows the best. And here, it's very important for us to keep this in mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not mention these parts of these stories because he does not want to make it as a way how we know the story. He just wants to keep the main parts of the Hidayah so that we just keep our uh, attention to these uh, parts of the story that are of Hidayah, of the, uh, that will teach us the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and of course, as the instructions are given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, through that, it's to the ummah. فَلَا تُمَارِ فِيهِمْ إِلَّا مِرَاءً ظَاهِرًا Do not argue about them, do not discuss anything about them, except just a general discussion. Which means, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is preventing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from getting into too many details of the stories beyond what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mentioned. That if these people now, uh, we know the background of the uh, surah as we talked about it before, and that was when the kuffar of Quraysh approached the Jews of Medina Munawwara, to ask them how to find out about the truthfulness of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or the status of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how would we know if he is a true prophet of Allah? And they told them to ask three questions. And one of the questions was about the people of the cave. So, now when these people came and asked them, later on even some Jews came and asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more details about the same stories, and then there are hadiths that talk about some Christians asking Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about their story also. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَلَا تُمَارِ فِيهِمْ إِلَّا مِرَاءً ظَاهِرًا Don't go into too much discussion with these Jews or Christians of the Kuffar or the Kuffar of Quraysh about these people and about their story. This is enough. Whatever you know from the book of Allah is enough. Don't try to go into too many details of it. وَلَا تَسْتَفْتِي فِيهِمْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدًا And do not ask about them, which means about the people of cave, any of these people, whether they are the kuffar of Quraysh, or Jews, or Christians, don't ask them about any details regarding the people of the cave. وَلَا تَسْتَفْتِي فِيهِمْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدًا Don't ask them about these people at all. And this is to tell us, sometime when we learn things from history and we get very happy that see now I found more details about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there is nothing to be happy about there. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned is enough. Yes, just to know more details and to know them is nothing wrong. But to, con- but to consider it part of the same story that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Quran is wrong. Wallahu alam, if that is the same story as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. So, we should never take stories from here and there and apply them on the ayahs of Al-Quran al kareem Yes, we can see things like this happen in the history and similar type of situation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about in these ayahs of Al-Quran. And at the same time we learn that to learn the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we do not depend on books of history or on those Jews and Christians who are narrating their stories just from here and say for us to understand the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we do not depend on those. We depend on the book of Allah that explains itself and the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then we have Sahaba Rizwanullah alayhi wa sallam explaining the other ayahs and the rest of the stories of Al-Quran Al-Kareem or the backgrounds of the ayahs of Al-Quran Al-Kareem and Mufassirin of the Ummah they 
they have collected all of this information and then raped that all of the trash. This is enough for us. So, this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَسْتَفْتِفِيهِمْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدًا Don't ask about the people of Kiev. Any of these people who are talking about their stories and they are just trying to narrate their stories out of hearsay. وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ غَدًا إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ Don't say about anything that I would be doing this tomorrow without saying inshaAllah except if Allah wills. As we were talking about the background of the surah, at that time we also talked about this and the background of this ayah specifically, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to those people when they asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the three questions, he told them I will give you the answer tomorrow, come back tomorrow. And he was hoping the next day he will receive the revelation and he will have the answers ready for them. When those people came back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the answers were not ready. So he asked them to come later on. He said, I don't, I didn't receive no revelation. And the revelation did not come to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for 15 days. It was delayed for 15 days. After 15 days when the revelation came, this ayah was revealed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ غَدًا إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ Don't say that I would do anything tomorrow without saying inshaAllah. That was an instruction to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and a lesson to the ummah that because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forgot to say inshaAllah, this is why the revelation was delayed. Now, was it a sin not to say insha'Allah or is it now a sin not to say insha'Allah? No. It's not fard or wajib to say insha'Allah. But it's adab. Adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you're saying I would do it and you forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who's the real doer. So this is why it's adab with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like Anbiya alayhi salatu wa salam to miss any of the adab. There are different categories of people when it comes to the deen and iman. And depending on how close the person is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how deep that person is with his deen and iman, this is how strictly that person is judged by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in fact corrected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that he will stay at that level Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like to see that person getting below his level. A person has many children. Some of these children might be two years old. Then there is another one who is 5 years old. There is another one who is 14 and 15 or 15 years old. All of these are the children of the same person. But parents treat their children differently according to the age of the child. 15 years old boy is a grown up boy. And accordingly, he is expected to maintain the rules, to make sure that he behaves properly, he pays the proper respect to his parents and guests and other people and behave when he's around his parents. The five-year-old boy is not expected to be on the same level as the 14 years or 15 years old boy. And the younger one who's only two years old is never expected to be anything close to the other ones. He will behave totally differently. If the older one sees the father was playing with the young one, his young brother, who is only two years old, and this young brother grabs the beard of his father and then slaps him on his face, and the father takes his hand and kisses his hand, he says, my father loves someone slapping him. 
So he goes and he grabs the beard of his father and slaps his father too. What do you think he will get next? See, this is where we understand the difference between these, as there is Arab now, that 15 years old boy, he has the right understanding. The father doesn't want him to get back at that two years age. He wants him to behave according to his age. Same way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treats people according to this. That if you have got up to that level, and you have been grown up, Allah has given you the right understanding to be very close to Him. Now to, for you to behave like a kafir, like a mushrik, like a munafiq, or like a person who is at the very beginning stages of iman, is not acceptable. And sometimes, not knowing this, we make some major mistakes in our life. And we are just, we behave just like those ch- the child who is 15 years old and starts slapping his father after seeing the younger one did the same thing. He thinks our father approves this. He loves it. See, he's still playing and he kisses his hand. So simply means he loves someone slapping on his face. This is how we behave sometimes. That we see the kuffar. In spite of all of this kufr and shirk, when, and they're doing every evil, we see them having so much, and still getting more, we think, oh, this is what Allah likes. So we start behaving the same way, and then we get a slap back on our face, that, what are you doing? And he shakes us up, and we start complaining, why? How come he's not accepting it from me? See all of these people, this is how they're doing Okay, do you really want to be in that level? Do you really want to put yourself down to that level? And this is why you are comparing yourself with them with ayahs billah? See what a major mistake we make? That a person comparing himself, a mu'min compares himself with a kafir? A kafir who has no relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who broke every relationship with Allah? A boy that's on the street, you see him just playing around and running here and there in the middle of the road. You don't know the boy, you don't care about the boy, you won't tell him nothing. Your own son, as soon as he will jump over there, you'll pull him back and you'll lock him and lock him inside your house. If your son will start complaining, how come you didn't say that to the other person anything? And here you lock me inside the house and that boy does that every day, every day he's out there on the street. I did it only today, and you lock me inside the house? Yes. You will lock your son, and the ones that you love, because you don't want them to be at that place. You know they don't belong there. That boy, you don't care about him. This is exactly how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treats the believers, as comparing to non-believers, that those people, okay, you can be on the street, you can be doing this and that and coming out with ring haram. One day, you will be judged for all of these things and you will have that severe punishment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in the Quran. So let them do it. Wa umli lahum. I keep on giving them chances. Let them do more. But, when a person who says, I'm... Um, Attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have taken the shahada. I believe in Allah. Now, he wants to do the same thing. Allah says, no, 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 no. Not for you. You can't be over there. You don't belong there. I'm going to lock you in here now. Why? To make sure when that boy will be hit by a car, you are not there with him to get hit by that car. To make sure when that boy is arrested because of all of these things that he has been doing, you are not arrested. When that boy is disrespected, you are not disrespected. You don't belong there. So, this is exactly how our relationship is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then depending how high we get and strong we get with our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would love to see that person being on Surat al-Mustaqeem and a stage comes for some people, even 
missing a sunnah is not acceptable. And for Anbiya alayhi wa salatu salam, even missing an adab is not acceptable. So we cannot compare ourselves with them thinking, oh, see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made that mistake also. That was, he only forgot an adab. And Allah corrected him for that. And day and night, we make mistakes regarding our fara'id, regarding wajibat, regarding sunan. We don't get punished like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not put us in that situation, of course, because we, don't, we, are, we are not of that level. But at the same time, if we are at certain level with our iman, we should realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will correct us sooner than later so that we stay and remain on that level and we don't just keep on going down and down. And many times when people start objecting, getting at a higher level and they start objecting against Allah and Azubillah, how come those people are doing it and nothing happens to them and they're happening to us and to the ummah and to our people? Simply, those people, as soon as they stand that objection, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then leaves them alone. And they keep on getting down and worse and worse and worse. And finally, they get to the stage where even their iman is in doubt. So as believers, we should know that we are not to compare ourselves with the kuffar and fujar, with the mushrikeen, with munafiqeen, with those who are disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala day and night. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about that in Surah Zukhruf. وَلَوْلَا أَنْ يَكُونَ النَّاسُ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا He says, if this was not a fact, that all the people will become disbelievers. Muslims will leave their deen and run away from it. لَجَعَلْنَا لِمَنْ يَكْفُرُ بِالرَّحْمَانِ لِبُيُوتِهِمْ سُقُفًا مِّنْ فِضَّةٍ وَمَعَارِجَ عَلَيْهَا يَظْهَرُونَ I would give the disbelievers, I would give the disbelievers, Houses made out of gold and silver. The roof of the house will be out of silver. Their couches, their beddings will be of gold and silk. I would give them all of these things. Why? Because let them have it. Let them use it as much as they want. For how long they are going to use it? Just in this life? 60 years, 70 years. And what is the 60 years? By the time the child is grown up, finishes his or her studies, that person is in early 30s or late 20s. Half of the life is almost gone. By the time the person works hard to get himself settled, almost the other half is gone. And now, back pain and knee pains and all type of things that throughout the body. And by the time he has enough to be able to use it, the body doesn't allow him to use it. It's time to go now. And all the person is thinking about is retirement plan. This is the whole life. That's it. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, let them get it. Let them use it. See how much can they use and for believers, for those who say to Allah that, Ya Allah, we have relationship with you, we are attached to you, we like to obey you, we like to live our life as for your instructions, Ya Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says then, I will give you all of this, much better than this, much more than this, at the right time, at a time when you will be able to use it forever. And then you won't have none of these problems that either losing those things or worried about just leaving yourself from this, from this world. Khalidin. The word Khalidin is very important in Quran. That you will have it forever. You will never miss it. You will never lose it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala corrected the mistake of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the mistake was not about any faraiz. It wasn't a sin. It was just missing an adab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that delayed the revelation for 15 days. Now, if you think by delaying the revelation for 15 days, what could be the effect of it as human beings if you think? The effect of it could be very serious. That all of these kuffar, they are waiting to get the answer 
and they are taking the answers, they are considering the answers to these questions, these three questions, as the sign of the truthfulness of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So not having the answer at the right time will make them believe that this is not the right deen. But you can see how independent Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. He says, this is what you want to think? Go ahead and think that way. You cannot wait for me? Then don't wait. Go. Go on your own way. I will reveal the time when I will think is right. Not the time that you think is right. I will give you the answer the time when I want to give it to you. Not the time when you would demand it. He's independent. This is our thinking that the person will not believe. He will run away. He will object. He will do this. This is our thinking. For as far as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is concerned, He says, I'm independent. I'll do it the way I want. And I'm not going to be under pressure by these people that all these people may not believe it will be if it is delayed. No. I have to do this, teach this adab to my Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I will teach him this adab. I will do whatever I have to do. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at the end of Surah Al-Shamsi wa Duhaha. وَلَا يَخَافُ عُقْبَهَا After talking about destroying many nations, he says, I'm not afraid of the consequences of it. Other people will be afraid. He says, I'm not afraid of anything. These people who died, their relatives later on will come, other people will come and say, oh, why the whole nation was destroyed? Allah says, I'm not afraid of any of these things. What people will say, what people will think, what will happen, this is not my fear. I'm not under pressure for, by, by these things. I do whatever is right. Independently. Allah has come Totally independent. So, the revelation was late for 15 days. And after 15 days, then the revelation came as we talked about it in our previous sessions. And here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just teaches this adab to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and thus to the ummah that don't say I would be doing something tomorrow without saying insha'Allah. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Tells us the purpose of this, insha'Allah. وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ إِذَا نَسِيهِ Remember your Lord whenever you forget. The main thing is always remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember your Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants everything to happen with His name. The sad with Bismillah. Ending Alhamdulillah, and MashaAllah, and SubhanAllah, and Alhamdulillah, and here is teaching, teaching us, InshaAllah. And it's telling us, وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ إِذَا نَسِيدٍ If you forget to say InshaAllah at the time of saying something that I will do it tomorrow, or the day after tomorrow, or do it some time in the future, if you forget at that time, whenever you remember, say InshaAllah. وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ إِذَا نَسِيدٍ Remember your Lord when you forget. And we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us a very important thing for a human being is to always keep Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in mind. To remember whatever we are doing is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as part of that remembrance, the person should utter that name of Allah with his tongue also. So, insha'Allah is a way of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us to remember Him at all the time. Whenever you forget, then now we spend more time remembering Allah. وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ إِذَا نَسِيدٍ وَقُلْ عَسَىٰ أَنْ يَهْدِيَنِ رَبِّي لِأَقْرَبَ مِنْ هَذَا رَشَدًا And say, perhaps my Lord will guide me to a situation or to a something that is nearer in truth than this. Which means, these people are considering the story of the people of cave a very surprising story, and they consider it as one of the very major signs of the existence of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that this is nothing, this story is nothing. As per what's happening in the world, compare that, what this story, this story is nothing. So when people run after things that are very surprising 
and then they consider those as great signs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you might have greater signs around you that you are not paying attention to them. Each and every ayah of Qur'an is a greater sign of the truthfulness of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the story of the people of Cain. What is the story? People living for 309 years, is it something too difficult for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I mean, Allah who can make people live for 60 years, for 70 years, for 100 years, He can make them live for 300 years also. What's so difficult about it? So, this is why at the end she's telling us this, putting this message also there, that don't think that this story is a very great sign. This is only because they uh, the asked a question. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'm reading this story. Otherwise, it's not one of the greatest signs of the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are many more signs and there are greater signs that are already there in place about the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we see the sun, the light of the sun. We don't even have the, have the exact count of years. How many thousands of or millions of years will Wallahu alam the sun is providing it's light and heat to the world. Free of charge. And doing it every day. Without missing a single day of the, of, of the life. So some people sleeping for 300 years. Is it something too much? And we see the whole system running for so many years. From the beginning of the creation. And keeps on running so smoothly. There are so many signs. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us of this fact. وَلَبِتُوا فِي كَهْفِهِمْ Now, after reminding us of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us the number of years these people stayed in their cave. وَلَبِتُوا فِي كَهْفِهِمْ ثَلَاثَ مِئَةٍ سَنِينَ وَزَّادُوا تِسْعَ They stayed in their cave for 300 years and exceeded by nine. So, altogether, 309 years. How come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say they stayed in their cave for 309 years. But he said, they stayed 300 years, and then, was that tis'a? And, in addition to 300, they stayed 9 more years. According to some of the Mufassirin, the hikmah behind it is, that it's the difference between the solar and the lunar year. Every 100 years, of solar years, it's 103 years of the lunar calendar. So 300 is 309. 300 years of the solar calendar is 309 of the lunar calendar. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned both because Sahaba Ridwanullah were keeping the record and they used to count the months and the years according to the lunar calendar. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned it according to that also. And the people who are, who are asking, uh, the Nasara, the Christians, when they came and asked, they were keeping their uh, days according to the solar calendar. And accordingly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned both, that they stayed over there for 300 and exceeded by 9, which means 300 according to the solar and 309 according to the lunar calendar. قُلِ اللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا لَبِثُوا After mentioning that exact number, still Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلِ اللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا لَبِثُوا Say, Allah only knows how long they stayed over there. And again reminding us of the same fact. That if people are discussing, and now someone will come and say, I have done a research. And you know, according to the bones over there, we found some bones in the cave. And according to those bones, it says that these people must have slept in the cave for 500 years. We'll say, Allahu a'lamu bima rabitu. Allah knows the best how long they stayed. And Allah is saying 309 years. Because nowadays, subhanallah, in those days no one would know why Allah is mentioning this. But now we know that 
people on the name of research. Research nowadays is the name of changing the facts. If you want to change the facts and come up with a new lie in a very nice way and as per our understanding that our time people are very civilized. So, even our lies are very civilized. People don't just come up and say, I'm lying. Or I'm making it up. They will write a whole report to prove it right. And then that lie will be the result of research. And because it was a result of a research from a professor of such a high university that that has so much respect in the world. So therefore, all the facts that were known prior to that are all changed, are all gone, and now because of this research, now we will accept every person should admit and believe in this lie. This is a research. Just like Darwin when he came with his theory, he did a research. And if you really summarize his research, he's telling you you are a son of a monkey. And people say, oh, he did a research. So, mashallah, then... We could, we, we are children of monkeys. Because someone did research on us. So changing the facts. You can do whatever you want. As long as you give it the name of research. This is not the father. And he is not this person's son. How do you know this? We did a research on this. So. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, therefore, He told us already there, Allahu a'lamu bima labitu. Allah knows the best how long they stayed. Now, no, we don't need any more research on this. Absur bihi wa asma'a. Ma lahum min dunihi min wali. Wala yushrik fi hukmihi ahada. How seen is He and how hearing is He? Which means He sees everything in a way that no one else can see. He hears everything in a way that no one else can hear. Absur bihi wasma. Ma lahum min dunihi min wali. They have no helper beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wala yushriku fi hukmihi ahada. And he does not share his kingdom with anyone else. So he has no partners. He's not sharing his kingdom with anyone else. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything. So, we just take, when Allah, once Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us of something, then this is the knowledge, that is the thing that we need to believe, and we have to go with. After reading now this story, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is again reminding us of the facts for which this story was revealed and narrated. And that is, Keep on reciting the book of Allah that has been revealed to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And thus the instruction is given to the Ummah that keep on reciting the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep on reciting the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the main thing that keep yourself attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Read the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لا مبدل لكلماته No one can change his words. No research in the world can change his words. وَلَن تَجِدَ مِن دُونِهِ مُزْدَحَدَ and you will never find any refuge beside him. وَلَن تَجِدَ مِن دُونِهِ مُزْدَحَدَ It's really telling us a lesson from this story. That we just talked about the story of the people of cave. These young people went into a cave. They thought, and everyone else thought, that now these people will really have to suffer. And they will be going through such hardships that no one may have faced those type of hardships in the history. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَنْ تَجِدَ مِن دُونِهِ مُلْتَحَدَى If people are depending on others and they think that these people can help us, and these people will give us support, and these people will, uh, uh, they will give us refuge, and they will help us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no. You will never find any supporter, any helper, any refuge beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And this is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to make this dua. لا من جاء ولا من جاء منك إلا إليك. We have no protection and no refuge anywhere beside you except to come back to you. When a person is afraid of a beast, what do you do? Do you run towards the beast? No, you run away from it. When a person is standing by with a gun in front of you, to protect yourself against the person, you run away from the person. But, the situation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is different. When you're afraid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, run towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And his rahmah is such, that he opened, as he will see you running towards him, he will open the doors of his rahmah for you. وَلَنْ تَجِدَ مِنْ دُونِهِ مُنْتَحَدَى This is what it means. You will never find any refuge beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even if you are afraid of him, run back to him and come back to him. How to do that? How to make sure that we are always coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِينَ Always keep yourself with those who keep on calling on their Lord day and night. What a beautiful instruction given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about how should we attach ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can we come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can we make sure that we are always going towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not trying to run away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is by being with those who are doing the same. If we stay with those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who do the ibadah of Allah, who are involved, يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِينَ Who keep on praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala day and night. They remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala day and night. يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَا Who are seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you will become one of those people. And of course, this is the rule of the life. Whatever you like to learn, be with those people who know it, and practice it with them. You will learn how to do it. People who like to become wrestlers, they spend their time with those wrestlers. One who would like to learn boxing, will spend his time with those who keep on doing this boxing. Football players, they spend their time with those people. And this is the rule of the life. Every train of our life, whatever we learn in our life, you be with those people and around those people who are out of that field, and you will learn it from them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you want to be the one who is attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who keeps on doing the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then attach yourself to those who are doing this. وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيِّ Keep yourself. What, what does wasbir mean? Sabr means patience. وَاصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ Force yourself to be with those. Your nafs will try to run away. Your nafs will say, oh, now this is enough. How long can I stay over here? Now I need some fresh air. Let me go out. And the calf is too long. Where are you going to get the fresh air from? How about the exercise then? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is why the word wasbir is used. That have sabr with, and make sure that you control yourself at that time. And sabr with that. On what? مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ Force yourself to remain with those who يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِي who keep on praying to the Lord day and night. This is the life. We say to those people, you are backwards. And Allah is admiring those people who are yad'una rabbahum bil ghadati wal ashi, who keep on praying to the Lord day and night. Allah admires them. And we disapprove of those people. We say these people don't know anything of the world. One of the scholars have said a beautiful thing. He said, before you become a alim, you should know that you will be accused of something for sure. 
if you stay in the masajid, if you stay at the place of worship, you keep on doing the ibadah of Allah, people will say, look, he doesn't know anything of the world. They just know only how to sit in the masjid. They don't know what they're talking about. You come out and start getting involved in all the things, and people say, look, what type of a scholar is he? He's getting involved in all this politics. So they will never be satisfied. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشَيْءِ Praying to Allah day and night is such a quality that Allah says to others that I would love you to spend time with these people. And subhanallah, as Imam Ghazali rahimahullah have explained, and I think Imam Razi also, that see how beautifully Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the greatness of those people and approving those people who are involved in the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala day and night, that he's saying to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this ayah was revealed on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the first order to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِينَ To stay with those who are praying to their Lord day and night. Telling Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not because he needed it. For us we need it. But for him so that we know that how great those people are that Allah's Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is asked to be with those people and in that group of people. Just quickly running to the background of the ayah. Some leaders of the kuffar of Quraysh came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they said, the thing that is keeping us away from you is these poor people sitting around you at all the time. And whenever we come and to sit with you, we find these people are there. And of course, we cannot sit with these people. There is a huge difference in level. Our level is much higher than these poor people there. We can't sit with these people. So, what we like you to do is, assign some time for us, a special time for gathering. When we come, we won't have to sit with these people. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thought there is nothing wrong. That if I give them some time, when I ask these sahaba not to be there, it's what means these people will come into the deen, once they will learn the deen, they come into the deen, then they will know there is nothing wrong to sit with these people, but at least to bring them into deen. And these sahaba won't mind me telling them, okay, can you just be out for some minutes or for half an hour, come back a little later, let me finish talking to these people. They won't mind it. As he was thinking about it, the ayah was revealed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't do that. Tell these people, if you are willing to come and sit with these poor sahaba ridwanullahi alayhi wa sallam, you are welcome, and if not, then just stay away, we don't want you in this deen. But we are not going to accept these conditions, that I'm not going to sit with these people. Later on you will say, Oh, before Islam, I never used to sit with these people. Now, we like the front stuff for us in the Salah. And every person brings his degree, that according to my degree, the stuff is assigned according to the level of your education. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says no. None of these things are approved to Allah. Stay with those. There are narrations that say, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of course, he used to have these sahaba, and especially the poor sahaba, Ridwanullah and Ismail, spending a lot of time around Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And let me quickly tell you how they used to spend the time with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so that we also learn how to benefit from the people of deen. It wasn't that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 24 hours a day, is giving them lectures. Or throughout the time he's sitting, he's giving them the siha and talking to them and always he's writing something. No. Most of the time he's doing his work. People are coming, they ask him, they would ask him questions. He will answer to their questions. He's doing his own work. Then he goes home, he finishes his work. He comes and sits in the masjid, he's doing his zikr, his tasbihat, his ibadah. And they are sitting around him. But the thing they are doing is they are sitting with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and watching each and every action of his. And at the same time, spiritually, whatever Rahmah is descending on the Prophet of Allah, they are getting their shares of it also. 
and they would spend their time with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in that way. When these kuffar initially they came and they requested Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to ask these people to leave, another ayah was revealed, and that ayah says, "Wala tatrudil nadina yadun rabbahum bil ghadati wal ashi." Don't force these people out of your gathering, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who are praying to the Lord day and night. So then Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam decided he would never ask any of those people to leave. And these Sahaba read that we used to sit and we would sit for as long as we want. He would never ask us to leave after that. If he wants to go somewhere, he would leave. He would get up and go. But he would never ask us to leave. When this ayah of Surah Al-Kahf was revealed, وَصْبِرْ نَفْسَكْ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, stay with those who keep on praying to the Lord day and night. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was hesitant to even get up and leave. He would not ask them to leave. And he was hesitant to get up and leave himself. Although this is not what the ayah means, that he can never leave. But of course, Looking at the wordings of the ayah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would try to be there as much as he could. When those sahaba realized, that's it, when we realized that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does not like to leave anymore because of this ayah, then after sitting with him for some time, we used to get up and leave so he can leave. So this is how they used to sit and benefit from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And most of these people were the people of Sufa. The first Islamic school in the history of Islam, that those people who devoted their lives to learn the deen from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, people of Sufa, they left their homes and everything. They used to just stay over there and be around Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So Allah subhanahu wa taala tells us the way of learning the deen. Remember, this deen is not the name of words. As far as learning words, there are many non-Muslim professors who teach Islam in universities. And if people like us, if we sit around them, we will find that they know more hadith and more ayahs than we do. They spend their whole life doing research on these things. But where is the practice? So the main thing, of course, that knowledge is important, but when it comes with the practice. The knowledge that will make the person practice, not the knowledge that will keep the person away from the practices. And this is why. Deen is not the name of this word. These words are a way to help us practice the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These books, are a way to learn the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the main thing is what we do after learning it. And that is the most important thing of our life. Does it come into our life? Do we really put it into practice? Do we really think of changing our lives? Do we really think of following the ways of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? If not, then we can read the tafsir of the whole Qur'an and we can read all the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa just with the purpose so that if people will ask me questions I can answer to their questions and I will become a great scholar of Islam so people will say mashallah a great mufti very knowledgeable person if this is the only purpose then this knowledge will be against the person in akhirah so the main thing is we, this knowledge should put us into practice. And this is the way how we will be able to practice the knowledge that we learn. وَصْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ Being with those who are practicing the deen of Allah. And I'm telling you this from experience. Because we went through this throughout our lives. Learning and teaching. And we really find that there are so many things, we read them in the hadith, but were never able to put them into practice. We knew it's so good. Never thought of putting it into practice or how to put it the right way of practicing it until being around the people who were really practicing it and that opened up our eyes. SubhanAllah, this is how you practice the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
Without it, really, we can never even have the right understanding of the ayahs and of the ahadith. And this is what Allah says in Quran. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ Have the taqwa of Allah. وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ اللَّهِ Allah will teach you. If you have the taqwa, Allah will teach you. وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ اللَّهِ What does this mean? Allah will teach you? That are you, do you, does it mean that then you will memorize Sahih al-Bukhari without reading it? No. Then you will have the right understanding of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, وَفْضِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ Instruction for all of us is spend time with those. Keep yourself with those who keep on praying to the Lord day and night. Seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَا تَعْدُ عَيْنَاكَ عَنْهُمْ Let, let nor your eyes overlook them. Don't overlook those people. Don't look down at these people. Let's look at these people. Look at their dress. They're, they, they don't know anything. Yes, a person who comes with a nice car, expensive car, and he comes, he's fixing his tie. And you can look at the person and say, MashaAllah, gentlemen, we get impressed by that person. Allah says, no, no, no. وَلَا تَعْدُ عَيْنَاكَ عَنْهُمْ let, your, let not your eyes overlook these people who are praying to the Lord and they are following the ways of their Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Don't overlook those, these people. These are the people through which you will get your deen. These are the people, by staying with them, you will get closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It reminds me of the hadith. The hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari, I'm sure all of us, we know this hadith, but we may not have remember, or we may not have got the point of the hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us the importance of spending time with the virtuous people, with righteous people, before we are able to change our bad behaviors. We all have things that are not good in our lives. How can we change it? The way of bringing the change is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us over here in this ayah. Being with those people who are practicing it the right way. And this is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us in the hadith. The hadith is of the person who kills 99 people. I'm sure you remember the hadith. A person who killed 99 people. And then he went to a scholar to ask him if he can get the forgiveness of Allah. That person told him, how can you get the forgiveness of Allah after killing 99 people? So he said, if there is no tawbah for me, then I better continue with doing whatever I was doing. And he killed that person also. So now he goes to another person and asks him the same question, that now I have killed 100 people for halim and tawbah. Is there any tawbah for me? He said, yes. وَمَنْ يَحُولُ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ التَّوْبَةِ Who can prevent you from getting the forgiveness of Allah? This Rahmah is great. Has no limits to it. So sure that doors are open for you. But there is one condition. اذهب إلى قرية فلان You cannot stay in this town. Because you are doing all of these wrong things in this town. You have those friends that are helping you with this. Go and spend your time with some virtuous people in the town. There are some good people, virtuous people in the town. Spend your time with them. If you do that, then, of course, that will give you a firm intention of changing your lifestyle. And, by being with those people, that will give you the right direction of the life, you will be able to give up the sins that you are committing, and change your lifestyle. So he was going there, and we know the hadith is long, I'm not going to go into the details of it, on his way he passed away, and finally he was forgiven. So the instruction given in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us, the instruction given was, that spend your time with those people and that will change your lifestyle. The bad behaviors that you have in your life will change only by being over there, by being with those people. So this is what's important. وَفْضِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَذَاتِ وَالْعَشِي And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Quran al kareem يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهِ All you who believe, have the taqwa of Allah. And in order to have the taqwa of Allah, what do you have to do? وَكُونُوا مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ Be with الصَّادِقين. Spend your time with الصَّادِقين. Being with الصَّادِقين will give us the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And this is the way how we can achieve the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of us the taqwa. Through this ayah and because of this ayah, wa kunu ma'a sadaqeen, the scholars and the fasreen have agreed that till the day of judgment, there will be sadaqeen in this ummah. This is why Allah is ordering us to be with them. Otherwise, He won't order us to do something that is not available for us. So, those people are always there. It's up to us to find the right people and then being with them so that we are able to practice the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of us tawfiq to be with the sadiqeen and to be of a sadiqeen and to be of those that are accepted and blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aqoolu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisa'ir al-muslimina wal-muslimat wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.